Despite all the what do you think? Nine? I don't think it's going to be nine. I'm thinking an eight. Like, like 8.5 or something. 8.5, like around there, like 8.3, 8.7. I will give the big New Yorker pizza from Pizza. Ooh! I was right. Look, read the subtitles. Uh, I'm going to give it an 8.7 out of I'm a 10. I'm the pro here. I told you. Sorry. Sorry for screaming. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I got too hype. I'm so sorry. I'm so I got two hype, I'm sorry. I, at the end of my last lesson video, I actually gave you guys homework. So what I did was I asked you to go into a set and basically to do a specific goal. If you want to be involved, this is included in my, my Discord. I said, what I want you to do is to go into a set, represent a strong RPS option for your character and study how your opponent responds. If they don't adapt to your option, keep forcing it until they do. Recognize that when you show these options, your opponent should adapt. That means when you do something, the expectation is they learn to beat you from it. They adapt to you, right? Try to be more aware of representing different options and be respectful of how your opponent adapts. It is expected that they adapt. I even included it at the end. So uh, B, this is from BT, right on the stream, also in the chat. Uh, RPS versus Gold Lewis, so they said, uh, ACL outside of Gold Lewis range, Chemical Love is a neutral defining option in the, you know, versus Gold Lewis matchup. When I heard the homework, neutral RPS came to mind as something I'm constantly working on as Eno. Experience Gold Lewis means I've played usually bypass this by back, da or dash blocking. So see, in this sort of case, if they were over, if they, your layer one is to ACL, a lot of the times, if you play against people who are usually trying to bypass it, you use some form of, A, you try to take advantage of the fact that they're being aggressive with their movement, or B, you, for, you just delay things more and try to catch them out of their rhythm. Let's see how they adapt. What's their adaptation? So Eno 6 is 9 frames, low profile. Round start beats far ass and round start behemoths. It beats all of them, really? Oh, round start 6 p until they adjust. That's smart. That is exactly how I play round start against Gold Lewis as well. So jump, HCL still hits, so you can kind of delay it. Crouching weight, I gain meter from whiffing HCL, but I try to gain advantage instead of note. They reacted with Skyfish and hit me. So then this sort of thing is good. You react, you acknowledge that they reacted, so then you know that they are spending time actually looking to what you do, which in turn gives you more options to add it. So uh, 6P, HCL whiffs at best, but punches Gold Lewis often, no adjustment. So I like this. So see it. So basically, like you, you understand, like these are a lot of situations where you can essentially weigh options in your favor based off how it's harder for him to deal with it. The harder it is for him to deal with it, the more you can kind of take advantage of how RPS is supposed to work. So round start two six eight. So they won round start. I adjust to six P, which wins. Nice. Both dash forward goes under. I adjust with preemptive far ass or jump pass. See, I like this, and this is how I would actually usually do it. If somebody shows that they're too patient in trying to jump in or even whiff punish you, usually it means you can either a walk them to the corner, which in turn makes the situations following much better. But two. Uh, you can also just force your offense right there. Because, I mean, they're looking for you to do something specific. Sometimes that specific thing is jump in on them. But, I mean, if you're, like, HCL, and especially if you're doing something where they you acknowledge they just react, that already gives you more information, right? So this is great. This is great. Where is that? Yeah, that's what I would have did. There we go. It's, it was literally at the start. That's what I would have did. Yeah, that's what I would have did. <laughs> That's what I would have did. That's if you're blocking and see how they chose jump D. I went for jump S, expecting them to dash again, but jump D counter hit me. So then, okay, you can see there's also, they're already adapt adapting from that, right? Skyfish wins if HCL isn't already out, just with jump slash air dash and dive or jump A. So it's D, now it's starting to get a little more developed. And as you can see, second set adjustments, 6B, HCL whiff, no adjustment. Later in their corner, they predicted HCL and 6 feet under three times in a row. I still had no reason to adjust. Yes, this is what I love to hear. That's what I would have did. Hi, ID, jump H. With because the spacing, he was now a lot closer, which made me hesitate. Adjust Adjustment was to play more reactively. Nice. Again, I like that. Usually the more preemptive that players get, the more your decision making is to go towards playing reactive. Because of that, I blocked far S and they pressured me. In the same way, like, you know, you can take advantage of the fact that they're playing more passive to react. You can use that as an opportunity to force more offense. The thing is, with options like that and this, usually what it means is the threat of it is usually more powerful than actually doing it. Like, once you represent, I'm going to just dash up and punish you it's almost like you restructure the rps around your approach there right because when you do that it's like it's a very loud adjustment right high ad jump force eight six i dash under and punish with 2k td adjustment look to react and punch air dash so yeah it seems like the adaptation was essentially to be a lot more preemptive in the first set and then force reactive plays which i like and that's usually how i would 
I would do it. That's what I would have did. The next game, HTL whiffed under this, but I blocked the behemoth. Later that same game, I reacted the 6P to it. Nice. In the final game of the set, this option punished HTL. I think it works at a specific distance and timing that there are better, much better choices. Yeah, so like if it's so specific, then usually I would not even adapt. One time they tried this when I was air dashing back and I punched it on reaction. I think it's too committal. I agree. If it's super specific, then uh, I think it's too much. They also tried it when I had jumped looking for skyfish. It was difficult to air to air. In that case, it looks like if, if you usually moving and then just reacting to how they move in, in conjunction would be a better decision. Or two six, I blocked adjustment preempt with more far assets US mid-range. Yes, you get it. Backdash punished by HCL. Not sure if they did this in general. <laughs> it sounds like HCL really shits on this character. <laughs> Cornered skyfish. I was sparing HCL as fast as possible. It got <laughs> No adjustment. I agree. That's exactly what you do. Crouch and wait. It whiffed. Adjustment is a dash jump S. Again, like I said, I like this. I dash, anticipated dash and the previous set was wrong. They hit me and fought out of the corner. So see, uh, if they start showing that they're being more passive, you don't have to be as greedy about how you do it. Clearing space and just the fact that you have a character in the corner is very strong. Especially if you have a, a neutral tool that controls their movement as well as something like ATL. Dash forward and 6P. ATL and 6P both with. And like those 6P is the option. Improve their spacing. Adjustment is sometimes wait between ATL and punish their dash buttons and button choices that's smart so see even if something like this whiffs where they're both like kind of stalemates you can see i i'm actually very impressed that you recognize this because this is something that not even a lot of top players think about the fact that this sort of option in this sort of situation even though like inherently you're not at risk this actually may this was technically a loss for you in terms of how it went because even though you didn't get punished the fact that gold lewis is closer means he can RPS harder, right? Or like uh, represent more options. So I actually, I like this adaptation already. Round start behemoth, 6P wins, no adjustment. A dragon encountered it by 6P twice. They chose 6P and clash canceled into behemoth. That's kind of, that's kind of brawlic. To adjust, I could choose 2H instead or prepare my own clash cancel. All, almost always, uh, especially if you use 6Ps, I try to do OS with FD after just in case. Would recommend that. Jump D also beat my 6P round start adjustment, jump P round start, or wait in 6P. I would almost never recommend doing jump P round start, especially against a character like Gold Lewis. I think waiting is almost always better. You have to remember that even though uh, RPSing does encourage you to be preemptive and you should, you have to be preemptive. The thing about it is in direct RPS situations, like it doesn't change how good your neutral is if Gold Lewis still gets in on you and starts his offense and just kills you, right? So I think like m more like, you know, reactive plays like that are okay. Obviously he can still start stuff like, you know, Varus into, you know, Behemoth or whatever. But of course the RPS after that is much better. If you somehow get hit by like Behemoth while you do Jump P, it's just terrible RPS on paper, right? So this is something that I would say, uh, the adjustment Jump P, obviously I'm not super familiar with how Eno versus Gold Lewis round starts are, but this would be a risk no matter what, even if, like he just reacts or if he just does nothing then it could put you in a worse situation just because inherently in in guilty gear if you're in the air above someone you are at a disadvantage uh deeper dash forward and six feet they counter at hcl adjustment to hcl less focus on contesting there so see a lot of your adaptation here i guess this is it but it seems like a lot of your adaptation that you should do is actually react more and you understand the baselines of it it sounds like goo just get a little too invested into challenging them more as these things go on which makes sense because of course if you develop like as you develop this rps which again you're very familiar with from the start uh the thing is they can always just go back to a less committal option and if you play into that it could be really bad uh very very good i like how you showed this uh, actually i'll grade your homework can i type here i'll give you an a an a plus good work you get the assignment. Jins. How do I pronounce this correct? I mean testament and these games were played between in a mix. Of floor six and seven. I was thinking I'm going to mash far ass and see what happens. I like that. But it occurred to me that far such is not a strong RPS option in every matchup. True. It is very long. It is now it leads into a good combo and counter hit. But the weakness of it is the fact that if you do not get a counter hit, you do not get anything. You're return off of it is very specific so against characters who have struggled to get in it's encouraged for them to rps with something like 6p in fact i can literally see underneath you say versus versus may 6p i bet that was a struggle the thing about this is even though the far ass option is again very strong the damage and how you get it is very linear so like let's say they do run up 6p against you because of how 6p's and counter hits work it's very unlikely you're going to counter hit them which means if you over like show too much far ass it means that 
you actually make it worse for yourself because again, this is very similar to Soul. You do not get any return unless A, they're stained or B, they get counter hit. That changes how the RPS works, but in this case, you get what I mean. On a base level, just RPSing around it isn't super great, even though it is a very strong button and one of their best. Over Overusing it has some weaknesses that can be taken advantage of in risk reward. Uh, yeah, I don't have much main experience. I thought my best option would be 6p, but this player is extremely effective at countering slash avoiding it and had good okay. I lost six games in a row by letting her get deep jump H to beat my 6p, then getting big counter hit. I had a lot of fun though. The rounds got closer towards the end when I started figuring out ways to keep distance and bully your approaches. Uh, the important thing about fighting Mei and especially answering her is how you keep distance. So there, there are ranges where she, you can't actually 6 her that effectively if she's jumping in. Like, let's say if she's close enough. However, if you're spaced enough, it's almost impossible for her to actually jump in on you. That said, that means usually when you want to answer your mate or you're looking to answer your mate, usually you'll want to do things like give yourself more distance. One of the benefits of May, her movement is still kind of linear. So if you use, like, if she's the air a lot, you could try using more preemptive crow, right? That would be a good adaptation for how this sort of worked, especially when players have this situation where they jump past it, kind of. Crow starts from behind Testament. So like if, if they ever anti-air, if that happens a lot, you can almost use crow more effectively as an anti-air. That said, it doesn't mean that you should. Usually it means in this case, you had the right idea. Your positioning was just off. You want to almost always keep distance until May is stained. Because if you don't, then you're probably going to end up losing your skill board. Do not panic or constantly force yourself into those ranges because it'll also make you very easy to deal with. But uh, like 6P obviously is like one of their best buns, one of the best 6Ps in the game. So I wouldn't stress it too much. Just try to tighten up your like where to stand. Maybe training mode like, oh, I have to be here if I want 6P to always work. ID button does not actually hit croucher. So you can crouch under it and like 6P after or air throw. Reverse Giovanna far S. So like against Geo, for example, she would be much easier to do this with because of how her approach is and how linear it is. So doing far slash against her is going to be much, much better. Far slash is extremely effective so much that I had to start, I started doing preemptive far slashes expecting her to run into them. So again, like that's really good. And even if she IDs, like dash IDs, it either won't get hit or you won't. Like the punish would not be that, that big for how big of a commit dash jump like you know jump back iid it can be against testament and then she began with punishing with drill so she took the third game of the match let's see you're at a, you recognize that you were being with punished so i mean the adaptations just react more right like i said with the vt one first round with all arbiter sign this player didn't know how to play neutral at all <laughs> but they had solid combos and pressure once I was cornered. I would like to elaborate on something like this. See, like, when you say, of course, like, I, I assume you don't mean this in a negative context, and I'm not going to judge you for this. What you should do is, instead of saying this player didn't know how to play neutral, you should think about what that means. Like, what, how do they not know how to play neutral? Were they just IDing at you? Were they, like, just running at you, trying to press close slash? You know what I mean? Like, stuff like that. That's what's really important. Obviously, like, they may not understand very basic neutral concept. Uh, there's always a reason and pinpointing where they're struggling and what they're struggling with is very important. Obviously, you can't always tell, but at least let me run at them. <laughs> However, they always did round start walk back, which let me do whatever I wanted. So I just set up stage. Well, I wouldn't say that's really, that's not really not knowing to play neutral as much as that's, as much as that's just like playing overtly safe, right? No, no, it, it wasn't, it doesn't mean at all. It wasn't mean at all. I get what you mean. In the context of this, it's, it's you know, it's professional paper. So I just set up singing for free and then overwhelm them the corner pressure and Arbiter 50-50s to win five out of six games. It looks like they're two completely, completely different people on offense and defense. This is very common. Uh, this is why it's important to pinpoint where people struggle with from here. If there are a lot of players, especially like players that have very volatile characters that do not learn how to play a lot of neutral well, but they're very good at running offense, right? That was actually the stereotype for Zotto players in older games. It's basically like they had no no idea what to do on defense or in neutral but once they ran offense shit was like a supercomputer. i've never played kai before really i'm shocked hi 2k i've never played against kai before he did send up around start which seemed to beat everything i tried until i started jumping see like this sort of adaptation here this is where you only needed to really react like you just needed to down back even if let's say kai does something like send up or arse like send up around start or or run up throw the RPS is actually in your favor to just react because even if he throws you, the situation is not as bad as if he 
if you block stun different. Unless it's a very specific like post block string situation. I had a different time timing the low performance you could go under fireball. I don't even bother with that. Usually what you should do instead, even though like you can't always do this, but you can actually just uh, react to the fireball and use the first hit of 2-3 success. So 2-3 success will actually destroy projectiles if you do the physical hit into it. So like, let's say, you know, when you do 2-3 success, it has the first like where they swing the scythe or whatever, and then the skull comes out. If you time the fireball into the first strike, it will destroy the fireball. So at a difficult time timing the low performance, you can't go under fireball, but it would mound up not mattering. Using the air ver more versus him in general was extremely effective. As soon as I neutral jumped a fireball, his pressure broke. <laughs> so I won the match 2-1. Jump back grave avoided everything he represented. ID back each grave is actually very effective, even against uh, Stun Dipper. So I like that as well. Uh, Testament jump S and jump D are extremely strong. You want to almost always do it. If this happened enough to where you said beat everything I tried, as in more than once, to where you were actually adapting, consciously adapting to it, that means that you could have just done nothing and it would have also been very effective. Sometimes at round start, the threat of the option is also, once again, stronger than actually using the option. That's why some some matchups, you can't directly contest with someone at round start, but for example, you can maybe contest with the RPS afterwards if you do nothing, right? So final layer, or final thought. Adapting to my opponents is still hard. I want to create a simple layer notes for each matchup so I don't forget things and can reinforce those cultures. I like that. So I'll give you... I'll give you a B plus. So you get, you understand a lot of it. And I, I like the approach, especially for, I'm surprised you're floor six and seven because you understand a lot of good stuff with it. I think it's just that you're currently in a point where you need to kind of get out of your comfort zone with a lot of this stuff, right? And it looks like a lot of your approach is to lean more so on offensive options, which is obviously really great. But one of Testament's strengths is that they can actually win very easily by doing things like with punishing and whatever because of how strong Stainsy is. So this one is Tekken, I believe. So I don't know Tekken that much, but I can, of course, tell you the blueprint of it. Okay. In conclusion, Hell Sweep don'ts. Don't spam Hell Sweep. Don't Hell Sweep on a wheeler. Real or fake wall split. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I can already tell you what this is. So this is this is something that's very common when you're at early levels. And then it becomes almost a it becomes a very fucked up problem. Where like some players will use options like hell sweeps that are very effective as like, you know, like just trying to catch you off guard. The risk award inherently is pretty bad. Hell sweeps are usually like what launch or punishable, right? At higher levels of tech and the threat of hell sweep is almost stronger than the move itself. It's very hard to get out of this bubble. Moves like hell sweeps are very powerful inherently not because of their award but because of how you have to play around them being incorrect against a health sweep on defense is not nearly as bad as being wrong about a health sweep on offense right if you're incorrect you get a major punish. if they're doing like really I random know. crouches and shit like that especially ones you can see it enables you to be more greedy with your offense in general right or how you force things if you represent health sweep enough the threat of health sweep is actually more effective than actually using health sweep once you've used Hell sweep. I know that sounds weird, but so I need to use Hell sweep. When an opponent stands up after Oki, after dropping a combo in their face, if it seems like you should do so and not because you can't. See, like that alone is a lot better. You should do so rather than you can. A lot of people rely on things like like Hell sweeps as like win options, where a lot of players will do this thing where it's they'll play it normal, you know, quotations normally. And then when they get low, they pull out the win options, right? This is when a lot of players will like try to overwhelm their opponent or like use like strong options that even if they're a little gimmicky, do not necessarily result in much, but they're probably hard to deal with, right? Like as the mind game goes on, it's less and less effective, right? Punish almost everything with it. Don't press again after opponent blocks. Isn't, isn't, aren't electrics plus? Aren't you supposed to duck it? They're, yeah, they're plus five. So you're actually advantageous, but if, if they duck it, you will get punished. Uh, you can obviously go for it. Unless you mean don't electric again after, right? Electric, do, learn devil moves. I don't know what this is. Like the, yeah, I was playing Kazuya. So his rage drive basically makes him go evil mode, you know? Mr. Evil. Uh, general tips, respect for punished hop kicks. Yes, if they represent hop kicks a lot, then it's the same thing where you get a punish if you're aware. The threat of the option, like obviously with things like hop kicks, is once you represent them enough, it becomes easy to like play around the threat of it, right? Down four and safe moves at around start, around end, sorry, instead of trying to outsmart opponents all the time. I actually like this. That's a good way to put it. 
Sometimes people get too big for their britches, you know what I mean? If you can get a kill with like a like a down three or a down four or whatever, compared to like doing hell sweep, why would you do hell sweep? Don't take every opportunity to press instead of run away sometimes. Yes, I mean that's there's also Tekken, right? So I mean there's a lot of advantage in using movement in that game. If you wish on a punishable, don't press again. Yes, yes, I like this. This is good. Like less committal neutral stay closer to the opponent than going full screen. This is very important because like obviously having distance is good and obviously more people want distance so they feel relieved when they're away like oh i'm not like i can react to what they're doing but you want to be close enough to where you can actually punish them right or like deal with them you don't want to be at a position where you cannot punish them for a mistake they made you know, if you just run away it's easy for them to just like walk you to the corner or whatever or walk you to a wall honestly this looks like a lot of their approach was to pay more active attention to adapting rather than trying to focus on their layer one which is great and that's exactly why that's exactly why i wanted to do this homework exercise so even though a lot of the ideas and concepts i think are very risky for tekken i give the homework con like idea the a and a i'll give it an a minus but i also don't understand tekken so maybe a question mark <laughs> main test when only focusing on them for this homework i've had some games lately where i was just testing any things in preparation for local so I asked a friend to spar with me and I tried seeing the precious RPS options. Yes, I like that. Scissors ID jump S. So your pro your baseline RPS is to fo force RPS. When I'm playing against characters that are harder for me to zone, I will use this to enter melee. I like how they said enter melee. That's cool. That's what's up. It's pretty safe. While well, playing against a friend with a very strong Naga, I was having a hard time locking him into beacon zone. So I decided to see how I could use this to engage. Depending on the range, it can be really good because like obviously Nago getting 6P will just be Fukio into 6H probably at worst which still can be really bad but like if you're really close and let's say he does close slash you will die right you basically will die so the risk reward in this especially against nago is actually quite high but depending on how this goes right and how they represent it it varies so you, they say uh i was having a hard time locking into being zoned so i assume that they're being committal which in turn i guess that's why you would do this which is good i wouldn't always recommend iding as a baseline rps option like you represent it enough even if you, they 6p you and you block you are at a disadvantage sometimes it can be bad just because it, it is almost like in all or nothing situation where it's either you start your offense or they start it right in an ideal world yeah you're putting your homie on blast in the homework i like that though that's a i'll give you a plus for that one eventually he started the 6 p.m and he out of it or after you to push me back out of my close slash engagement range it worked pretty well but it raged him out kind of hard i like that obviously like 6p against nago if you're in a position where you end up blocking or like you know 6p happens it's quite bad a paper 2d6s 2d6h against nago obviously it can it varies a lot depending on if they use clone, Nago can react and clone, but uh, if they're not, you can just use the threat of this over and over again. And especially Nago cannot get past this without using clone. It's almost impossible. He has to be at a, a very specific range in order to contest it. I like to alternate ground air and ground air, ground air as it creates a confusion for players and also a pen impenetrable wall of damage. I like that. This is one something I did often as you need the right conditions, but when I saw the opportunity, I just went for it and sustained it for as long as possible. Yes, for science, the watchers. And you actually, you bro or you really broke this down. The watchers, most players, once realizing that I'm not stopping, just stand there and watch the wall come out. There are people that, this is like, it's the, the fair, what is it? The weasel war dance. <laughs> This manic behavior gets the rabbit's attention. Who could ignore a stoat on steroids? What? <laughs> I'm not I'm not playing it after that. I know it's coming. The point is, this is actually how a lot of people try to play. Or they try to like mentally like overwhelm the opponent. I think that's a very unreliable way of doing it because one like it's it's a source of comfort and like where you like how familiar you are with the matchup or game, right? Once you stay in someone, it can create a very advantageous position. So if they just like kind of sit there and, and lock down, then try to go for a stain, you know. Platformers, I like that. Players that get the pattern go in right away, jump over the low. Blacks a uh, block slash duck under the high one slowly approaching until they can melee or engage the me <laughs> melee is always fucking me up sometimes it's actually good if they just id into your range sometimes it's bad also depending on the character like if if gold lewis gets in from this it's very bad like he's he's about to win probably if, whereas like someone like let's say soul <laughs> it doesn't really matter as much scissors a lot of these players will play scissors to my paper and get hits if i don't react appropriately that's good though Good, good acknowledgement of this, though. Rocks. Some players just try to move in by inching forward and blocking, which can create Grave Reaper gaps. 
must will get hit at least once in this process. Very unsafe. Berserker is a small set of su subs. A small. Oh my god, my English is fucked today. A very small subset of people will just run into this and ju super jump over it all and just try to something with hyper armor to get through. Often these players will fail the first time, sometimes the second time as well, then usually get through and close the gap after a small amount of attempts. So you can see that there's a pretty inherent weakness with how they do this, but it seems they have a strategy against some other play some players and some not so much against others. Rock 6P, I, I like this. Player was ranked above me, this shut down them down pretty hard and they did not adapt as well as they could have. Well, I got them out of the air more frequently, didn't stop them and I went easily 3-0. Bridget, another little hopper. This is something practicing a new Bridget, someone practicing a new Bridget, sorry. I expected a better understanding of the fundamentals, but 6P slapped her around very hard. 6P is very strong against Bridget. So uh, against Bridget, this is all you need. It's like almost all of her game plan has to be built around how she deals with 6P, which in turn lets you RPS from that. So the RPS from it, you inherently, this is actually really good. This is how you do it correctly. So overall, I'd say good. The only thing is I think their options were a little more linear. They really did, I think, truly focus on three direct options. So even though RPS inherently is correct in this context where they say IAD, basically approach, hold your ground, and throw at shit and kind of like a middle ground of holding your ground going in this is true but in some matchups it could be really bad it could be really good and in fact they also recognize it in this category here so while this is actually very good it's also kind of weird because it's not as linear as this rps is a lot more of a general concept around representing options so like let's say even in something like this which is inherently one option the rps changes just by you representing this. And it's something that, again, you can see it by the way that you separate this. So like, for example, you can do something a little less linear, like using something like 2 6 s Crow, uh, ID back 2 6 h jump ID 2 6 h right? Uh, even something like that will change the situation significantly. And that's something that makes Testament a little more complicated to understand. Because there are a lot of situations where like H grave will work if you do it here, but not there, right? Um, which is important for the character. Uh, of course, like, I, th I understand this is very much to their baseline, but I do like that how they approached it. I would just say maybe think about RPS from a little more of a transformative angle rather than a more linear, like, stable one, right? Uh, that way it's, it's a lot easier to understand, like, you know, this is good here, but once you represent it enough, it will create an RPS situation that could be unfavorable for you if you continue to represent it. I'll go. I'll give them a B. A B. I like it. It's good. So this is anonymous. So they play Testament and Poison. The biggest thing I learned from this is what RPS actually meant. It means simply. It simply means presenting an option that your opponent has to respond to. Even though I know this, I still sometimes struggle to understand the RPS around certain situations and whether it is not whether it is favorable or not for me. Uh the fact that you understood, you learned this, this is already an A plus in my opinion. The goal of it is actually to feel, understand what RPS is. Like once you understand they're doing this, I'm gonna do that, it becomes a lot easier to digest what that means. Once I learned what RPS is, I realized that I wasn't really presenting many options during my gameplay. I was playing as if the opponent would think about these options, but because I never presented them, they wouldn't really consider it at all and simply deal with what I had already presented. See? Great. I love that. The above point means that weak options can actually be pretty good sometimes. Yes. Yep. I never really considered doing things that I thought were less beneficial, but presenting quotations weak options actually make it more likely for the opponent to lose to my stronger options. Exactly. The threat of an option is very, very powerful. Of course, the thing about it is it depends on what quotations weak means. There are some moves that essentially are so weak, or for example, the situations that you force are so disadvantageous that ultimately the risk is almost worse for you inherently because the only way you get a better award is if they engage in the RPS. When you see them run up to you, you run back and prep, like do preemptive DP. Some players will recognize that you're doing that and obviously they'll just, they'll stop. They'll just stop moving and just watch what you do. If you are doing run up DP as a way of kind of challenging their button in a preemptive way, you would have just whipped. In, in turn, they didn't even play the RPS that you forced. They just ignored it, basically. There are situations like that where it's hard to understand what good and bad is from there, but this is very good. I firmly started, 
or I uh, finally, sorry, seriously labbing things out in training mode. Whenever I find myself not knowing what to do in a match, escaping opponents blocking, stopping opponent from escaping my offense, etc. I check out the replay. I check out the replay and try to recreate the scenario to see what options me and my opponent had. It's a little hard to implement what I lab in my gameplay, though. I often find myself falling back into what I'm used to. Making notes like this is very good for implementing it. In fact, that's what I always did. I would always make notes of something I wanted to do. I'd look at my notes between every round and I would specifically just try to implement it. If you play in a rank system, you find it, if you really care about winning, you may find it difficult. They said that they're Celestial though, so they probably do not mind. Uh, match notes I took are below. Didn't write about every match, just ones I felt like I could write about something notable. So, Guilty Gear Strive. Milia. This Milia really likes to approach in the air. I couldn't land a 6P on her, so I started going for air throws and I saw an opportunity. That's good. Uh, she didn't really stop going for air approaches, but she started going for preemptive attacks in the air. Felt like I could land a 6P on her a lot easier than that. See, I like RPS like this. This is very linear RPS that if Milia does like run up, like IAD button or IAD Capel, I actually do not mind that. And I'll almost always just willingly engage in it because inherently the risk of ward is always shifting away from Milia if she approaches like that. Milia's return requires her to be correct. Usually if you make Milia block, she's about one step away from losing. This sort of thing happens to Nago. Do you think he's one step away from losing? No, he's not. That sort of thing, I think, is how a lot of Milia players in tournament actually lose. They tend to have like a playstyle like that where they will just RPS with you because, I mean, their character can do it and it can be effective. What happens is they'll do it, the Nago player will like maybe not even know what they're going for or like fuck up or they just make a good read and you lose eight like 80% for it and these are they're really good million players that that still do that because it's kind of what the character wants to do but you can't always just do that so this sort of recognition i actually like and that's again that's what i would have did yeah that's what i would have did that's what i would have did bridget if she blocked to success she would do far ass to punish me sending crow in response i started to do six 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 far ass after two success was blocked i actually like that too honestly i would just juice up and either i would move out of the way if i could or i would just try to 6p especially because again 6p is so effective against bridget i can't overstate that enough the first few times she got hit i got a small combo off and then she decided to do micro dash block after two success which that is good that's a good adaptation and it would also deal with Crow, depending on how far they are. But in turn, that of course gives you more time to run offense, especially if your adaptation was 6-6 six, six far side. When she started blocking 6-6 six, six far ass, I started to use that moment, moment to send Crow. This Bridget didn't adjust this option, simply let me run front, fr free pressure from mid-screen. Probably could have far ass my attempt to send Crow or 6 speed against far ass. She could have, but again, the RPS inherently is kind of bad there. A far ass versus crow. And actually, the situation for Bridget that would have been best is actually to just, if she's too far, you can probably jump. If you're too close, you can just dash underneath it and crouch, uh, which is something to keep in mind. But I, I like the adaptation. Sin slash Kai. Notice that this person likes to use elk hunt versus slash scum dipper after blocking to the success. So I started doing just another art do these things as after they blocked the first one. That's actually 100% what you should do. Or you can do ID back H Grave Reaper, which is very effective. No adaptation, but they could have just ID'd in and hit me for a counter combo. Yes, that's correct. If they started doing that, something I would have done was simply block low after they blocked to six low. It's really block uh, while also still being able to react. Yes, I like this. See, this is RPS. Giovanna uh, liked her back away, round start, the fish for a whiff punish. This is a really uncomfortable round start for me. So in order to say that, I decided to do ID jump H at round start. A little ambitious. I don't really like that uh, adaptation. Uh, you almost, you almost universally, I would recommend doing something less committal into them. Like let's say ID back H grave. If they do something like react spiral arrow, you know that they're looking for it, right? I like things like that a lot more than something like just ID in. Because IDing in and getting six speed is not always, does not give you information sometimes. Depending on where you play, it can, but at a high level, it gives you no information. It's basically just like they reacted. Whereas if they do spiral arrow, that is information that you get about what they're doing, right? Do the success can be okay. The thing is, against Giovanna, uh, Testament's round starts aren't the best. So uh, I wouldn't really recommend a major thing like that. Usually I, I either 6P or I run away. <laughs> oh, I, I see it. They like to back away. I so, I'm sorry. They try to probably whiff punish you. After this, she stopped backing away as much and started to occasionally start the round attack with the attack, which made round start much more comfortable with me. If they're just backing away, then you can make distance with like, again, this is something that I would still recommend by doing ID back jump eight or 
ID back H Grave Reaper. I'd still say like same sort of thing. You'd want more information about what you're doing and how you do it. Nago played really passively, didn't use a lot of blood and waited for me to approach to try and react, but just zone him. Yes, decided to poke from afar with Arbiter. After they got hit repeatedly by Arbiter, they started to be more aggressive and started to use more blood, meaning that now I didn't have to worry as much about their specials. Yeah, it's correct. I like this. Almost every single opponent, anti-air, these sickos keep jumping. Yes, that's that's normal for Street Fighter, I feel like. Ibuki, I don't know this much about it, so I actually, I could tell you about the Sagat one. I actually know Sagat. They got me in the corner, they really played release passive, waiting for me to do anything before responding with an appropriate action, since I figured they were mostly looking for a jump in. I dashed up and grabbed them to take the corner. I feel like most, almost usually against Sagat, you'd want to play it pretty slow and walk, walk it out, rather than doing something like a dash in. Though, of course, it's much better. If you're <laughs> obviously looking for, if they're obviously looking for, like, a jump in, you can RPS around that if you want with things like dash ups, but I think it's kind of committal. They started applying pressure in the corner instead of waiting. So then in turn, let's do RPS with jump ins. Obviously, jumping against the god is not not ideal, but there are such, some situations where it's more reasonable to make a gamble like that. I don't know how poison does against the god, though. I could not tell you. Jarish Shin, is that actually how it's pronounced? Oh, being finished so fucked up, dude. I would have said J Ready. <laughs> J Retion, which is not even close. In round one of this game, I started. Uh, with 2D, which while a good low is still riskier than I should have done. I don't really think RPSing with something like 2D is that bad against Leo. Uh, especially because Anji gets some of his best return from 2D. I actually think it's one of his best options to, uh, to RPS from. He's probably one of the more privileged in terms of 2Ds. Not to say that you should always use it. And obviously Leo can beat it with his other options. And obvious, But obviously like it being it whiffing. And a lot of Leo players do try to whiff punish you at round start. It could be quite bad. I actually didn't get punished, but got counter hit by a 2D of my opponent's own. So I ended up playing on the back foot for a bit. That is okay. But again, remember, you want to think about the raw RPS of a situation like this. Round two, I once again started on the back foot after getting counter hit by another one of his buttons, but it was nowhere near as bad as before. Yeah. So like, again, the risk reward of like how you get counter hit and what the situation leads from. Anji obviously is built to RPS. So like, don't be afraid to just swing into people sometimes. Not to say like you should always do it, but uh, against Leo, I feel like more often than not, uh, it would be whiff punish or just preemptive button, you know? That would be how I, I think about it. I feel like also against Leo, it's probably kind of whack because he can just flash kick, right? RPS, he's encouraged to RPS with flash kick. Your baseline would want to be more around built around whiff punishing more often, just in basis for how a matchup like this would be. A lot of the time, you'll definitely get Leo players in blocks on trying to flash kick. Oh shit, you really... I like this. This is like something I made a long time ago. I need to find that, that image again. You should go into detail how you try to defend against them, just for future reference, because as good as this is, it's important to also assess like where you kind of fucked up. You can recognize your RPS on in offense and you focus on it a lot, and I like that. But it's I noticed that you don't talk about RPSing in neutral and defense as much as you focus on the offense uh the offensive RPS, which is okay, but I think this is a good sign of where maybe your flaws may be. Because obviously you do talk about what you do in neutral, but it's a lot more like cutting to directly what offense is or what it became. And then that turn that implies to me that maybe you're thinking more about getting into an offensive situation and running your stuff more so than how like things like whiff punishes and defense. RPS is a always all encompassing. So that means that, like, even in neutral, like, you know, far as this time, I go for a 5H with punish next time, is exactly the type of RPS that you could I do. Suppose, if anyone's curious as to my elaborated thought process while playing Anji Mito, the elegant martial dancer, please refer to my handy dandy diagram, which I've attached below. It's good. I like the, the after image. The after image here. Why is smiley face here? Fat, this is fat Fujin into question mark. <laughs> I like the detail. I just say I think you focus too much on offense. So I'm going to give you an A minus. Well, I'm going to give you, yeah, I'll give you an A minus because extra credit. But I think in general, uh, a good example is focusing more on how you RPS on in neutral and on defense. RPS is inherently a built in, like you believe it from a offensive standpoint a lot. But again, all things are RPS. Everything you touch is RPS. My homework. My homework. This isn't my homework. Who made this? Jump. So there, you may play it. First solo, you either challenge with far, far S or 2S or jumped. I 6P, 5K more, but adapted too late. Again, recognizing these things are good. You also use Gunflame a lot in that. 
and natural and neutral, which hit me a lot. So I run up 2s slash 5s in the third game. I won game three. In the game after, I tried a 2s after s dolphin. I just like that they use a dolphin emoji. Uh, before he adapted and got myself counter hit. In the game after that, I tried a 2s after dolphin before he adapted and got myself counter hit and lose that game. Should have just kept doing what I was doing. Yes, this is so true. This is one of the key things you should you should recognize. Doing too much, like to adapt preemptively, especially if they haven't represented you should be afraid of it, is a major flaw. And it's something I still do a lot. I'm not super great at dissecting between it. So a side note, beach ball on his wake up, he kept using DP on wake up. So yeah, he, definitely beach ball. That's what it's for, right? First Geo, back dash, the 6P might dolphin a lot. So try to run up more and got hit with dash up kicks. 5H then dolphin to cover both options. Probably 5H, yeah. I would actually say 5H or 2S would be great. I don't know if Slash is still in the chat. Slash may have good feedback on something like this. I would assume something like 5H to cover a mild bit of space and then at least like, you know, you can RPS from there. The more space that Geo gives, obviously the, the easier it is for you to play around her. Versus Kai, 2D stuff's most options after block S Dolphin when spaced out. 6K wins, but is risky for no reward. Yeah, I would not do 6K unless you have meter and it's like a, you're certain of it. 2k wins when close or just backdash 2s delay dolphin can counter hit him. I would definitely recommend doing this as a more consistent option. Something like 6k I think is way too much of a big gamble. Later he also started to jump backdash h and natural jump up dolphin might work there. Maybe you could also just use that to gain space. Remember that gaining space is very critical especially as a character like me too. Uh, getting like a hit in the corner is a lot different than getting a hit mid screen right. Versus Faust, tried to two piece of stuffed dolphins. I used 5 to beat it. Again, good RPS. Did a lot of super during my offense and I didn't adjust. I should have just looked at their meter more. That, and of course, you can go for more safe jumps. I don't know. Well, I think May can just beach ball right, right now, right? Like, I think she could just beach ball. Depending on the Oki, you'd want to do things like, especially against a character like Faust, you don't want to take, be overly consistent with like running offense. One of the best things you can do is just wait things out. Because if you are right, you will basically kill Faust. Like he will pretty much just lose off the <laughs> off fucking up like that. Even if he gets if he hits you, it's not that big of a deal. If you can recognize it, you should pay more attention. Jump 2K now is kind of weird. I would look for something that could give you a bigger turn, especially on jump 2K, or maximize your return for especially on reaction. Because you will always have fast players pressing jump 2k. That's a reality of life. You'll never escape it. The scarecrow on the left's eyes will light up. If he does not jump to the left, uh, if he jumps to the left one, the scarecrow on the right will not be illuminated at all. If neither of them are illuminated, that means he's coming from the sky. That's the easiest way of dealing with it. I don't know how May would punish it, but for example, uh, Testament doing like 2D or whatever is very, very effective against it. Chip. Got me a lot. With run up 2k 2d or id, his fast, so I lost the first game. I just in the sec by reacting with 6p or 2s 2k if you ran. I like the 2k. 2s can be a little ambitious against chip. Things like 2ks are very strong against chip, not just because they're very fast, but usually they interact with his buttons in a very disadvantageous way for him. It encourages him to do things like 2d more, run up 2d, which in turn makes his offense a little more linear. I didn't know how to play against Dolphin, so I just spammed Dolphin 5k and won. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. A lot of the RPS they understand, similarly to the first one we did. In this case, definitely write down notes. You'd want to use notes to to explain like what you should do, like what you're looking for. I'd say almost using this as notes for, for yourself as you adapt will be very beneficial for you because it seems like you didn't have a struggle actually adapting as much as you were like, oh, I, sh I need to do this faster, which notes can help you with. Courageous Amy, underscore, cow style, homework too. Now Celestial, let's go. Don't know what how to use RPS besides pick an option at random, pick an option I haven't done in a while. You will <laughs> jump on defense slash hold back slash backdash slash match. And I don't know how to use risk reward. There go. I'm pretty sure blocking tends to be low risk, low reward. Mashing tends to be high risk, varying reward. Jumping and backdashing tends to be medium risk, medium reward. But obviously if you hold back block the whole time, you're just going to get thrown to death. So RPS is basically pick an option, not at random. You pick an option that you know is effective. So let me give you an example. Testament, I could always just RPS by doing 2D success, crow. How they adapt to that will change how I decide to play from there on out. Basically, they give you information that you use. You use the information by, say, like, let's say they just run forward if you do it. Then maybe you could do something like far S, 2H. If they only do one option, I could just keep doing 2D success in the crow. Similarly, if they IAD, I, it would encourage me to RPS by not committing, which of course has its weaknesses. There are advantages and disadvantages, but if they're just doing IAD, then you will, you will just get 6P, right? That's the idea. 
it's it's about using good options that you know are effective, but also being aware of the fact that you need to adapt, right? You need to understand that adapting is very critical, a part of RPS. The reason why people use RPS actually so much is because the implication of one beats another, something else beats it, right? There's no option that just wins. There's always some way it can lose. So Bridget, 5HH with punish 2 d 6 k point blank media situation close touch beats match beats jump loses the backdash quotations loses to block i would say yes yes and no depends on what you do with them blocking or how you feel about them blocking some people feel forced to overcommit if their pressure gets blocked right like oh i can't go back to neutral pardon me but in this context you could argue that close slash them blocking it is still advantageous for you or, or for them throw loses to mash loses to jump loses the backdash beats block beats dp but loses the supers high risk low reward not always throws aren't necessarily always an option don't think about throws as much as a an individual option i think if you're thinking about how rps could work think about it more from the lens of like you use throws as a threat to enable other things right if they jump, you have information about them. If you backdash, you have information about them. If you backdash, or if they backdash, I feel like I would actually describe block like waiting as like, like it's a low risk, medium to high reward, depending on how it, how it turns out. If I would to get you, like get you to learn how to RPS, that's how I would kind of emphasize it because inherently your options will work in a way that encourages you to wait. And if you don't wait, your RPS will be weaker. Um, media close session to be played every time, so why do I go for throw, and how do I just accept waking, wake up DP? Do I just accept wake, eating, wake up DP every time? The, obviously the answer is oh, but failing that, how do I pick besides just picking at random, slash picking something I haven't done for a while based on vibes? Sometimes you just use the vibes, you know? You kind of get it, right? Like, inherently, if you view it from the risk of war, it's not always intuitive. But you have to also understand that, um, if you don't, even though it's the best reward, inherently, if you only do it, the high reward becomes no reward, right? Like, why would they ever match on you? So it's why, even though inherently you want to minimize risk reward, you have to give them a reason to do stuff sometimes. Some players will just do it, do shit because they're, like, nervous on defense or they just want to get onto offense. It's just important to play around that. Tug of War idea kind of gives an answer, but not really. Don't do the same amount of risk reward too much. Do them equally. Pick at random. Yes. I wouldn't say pick at random as much as I would say make informed decisions about them. Usually that means you don't want to be put in a situation where like if you're just throwing every time on offense like you do. Some people do a lot of pretty linear offense like one string frame trap. Next string throw. Next string uh, string frame trap. Next thing whatever. Um, Reaction 6p. Reaction jump p. Yes. Gain space. Reactive approaches. Yes. Preemptive play. Preemptive, preemptive 2k, 2p, 2s, yes. Preemptive yo-yo throw, yes. You get it. You actually, you entirely get it. RPS 1, 5h, knockdown 2d, 6k, close slash, into throw, 2s, or close slash. Yes, I like that. Did close slash throw a few times, they started mashing. Started doing close slash 2s more. Fucked up the timing a bunch, but eventually started frame trapping properly. See, even in this first, in this first discussion, you have quite literally done it. You've already done it. You may not view it as what it is because you may not associate it with rps or it may seem more complicated than it already is but this is quite literally you're just rpsing you inherently just did it see another good thing about this exam this exam this homework is that i can literally just tell you from something like this think about why you struggled when they were doing playing more passive are you, are you just too used to running offense are you too used to running like them just interacting with you it's important to think about that and maybe write down notes i want to think about like like if they jump back at round start i'm going to try to react and jump h or something right like something like that milia keep out with 2s and 2h and jump h established with the no <laughs> react with react oh, this is so this sound, this actually looks like my my notes i fucking love this this actually is some shit i would write in my my notes. I love that so much. <laughs> so this is good. React with React is so woke. I lose on the ground if I 2H and she hits Capel. So sounds like you would want to either delay your 2H or uh, move out of the way or fight in the air. Or like look for an air throw. I beat her air stuff with jump H. So yeah, you may want to do jump back, jump H. I think she ate every close slash throw so I didn't have to adapt. Today's takeaway is realizing that RPS is just a situation, correct? Realizing that preemptive slash passive slash establishing is not enough in neutral, 
each one of those has an RPS inside of them. Yes! 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 That's what I'm saying. Preemptive 2S will beat establishing Night Raid Vortex, but not an establishing Bandit Bringer. But see, the risk reward is something that actually dictates how you should respond to a lot of these. So, for example, if you're doing Preemptive 2S against Night Raid, uh, sometimes obviously you want to if 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 they're specifically doing it at ranges where you can punish it. But if they're doing it from like full screen, for example, maybe not. But for just because of risk reward from there, right? Whereas Bandit Bringer, it's usually better to just like just block it, right? So in both cases here, almost in this context, preemptive 2s will establish this, but you can use the threat of 2s to actually block more, which is I know it sounds weird. Uh, realizing that I don't really know how to force a situation with Bridget, if I hit 2k2d, I can get do my mix up. I thought you said my little mix up. If I hit 5hh into 2d6k slash mini close slash, I can do my strike throw RPS. But those both need me to get the hit first, and they are hardly so far as. So, notes. Mostly for me after chatting with a friend, round start, RPS always. Not always. Like, are they going to back up? Are they going to go for whiff punishes? It's stuff like that. Some characters can bypass it, but also, like, risk award dictates how our round start should be very heavily. There are options that obviously, like, will interact with others in funny ways, but there's always a streamlined, like, like kind of like a bubble of options that you want to stick to. And the reason for that is because the risk reward is usually the best, right? Like 2S, let's say, beats everything but, you know, 2D. But like far S will beat nothing but 2D, like that sort of thing. As a result, you're probably not going to press far S all the time, right? Of course, that'll mean that they press 2D more, which in turn makes far S stronger, but you don't have to always engage. It's RPS is opt-in, right? It's opt-in, um, even though you can never escape it, as weird as that sounds. RPS is a playstyle of sorts, yes! Turtling Soul is not forcing RPS at all. Not always, actually. Um, so like in this sort of case, sometimes, and this is only a case for characters like Soul who are pretty almost usually or almost predominantly aggressive, right? Like you will almost always see a soul player do commit more often than not. Because of that, a lot of people's default is actually to adapt to an aggressive soul, which means sometimes a soul actually being passive, sometimes those options inherently are better than actually committing for characters like soul because of how most people are used to fighting him. A lot of people have characters that are predominantly considered like ham like everyone laughs at like leo like oh uh, gorilla you know gorilla dude or some shit like that have you when you play against a a leo player that like actually consistently whiff punishes you you're like what I the fuck <laughs> you know what i mean fighting games are mental based like are they going to consider if they're wrong basically is the thing if not then you can't truly predict right it's hard to predict something like that a lot of players when they're new actually hate being hit by dp uh and of course like for some characters it can be truly miserable like if you play a character that spends like 80 seconds getting in and then they dp you it's like fuck it doesn't if it comes up frequently and it's something that you can read their DPs. You're not going to be right on every DP. And in fact, when you start looking for DPs, some people use that threat to do to take advantage of it. Like a very common risk that Leo players take, speaking of Leo, they would flash kick like four times in a row, then wake up, dash, throw you. Even though I, I think that's the worst thing you could do in existence. I think it's so bad. That is quite literally the benchmark of RPS and how it changes because... Do you think he would just do that shit if he hasn't represented DP? Some players will do that on the first go because they expect you to just think they're going to DP because they're a Leo player. It's kind of figuring out where they are on that sort of scale and how they adapt to it. Usually as information goes, though, things like DPs are not actually that big of a deal. Getting hit by them, like, obviously, I think the worst is probably, like, Sin or, or Leo because they can actually get a good, like, pressure sequence because of that you, you they don't get much but you get a lot the point is you get a big punish that's the sort of thing you're not always going to be correct and that's okay i think trying to like break that uh trying to break that mindset of like oh it's so bad i have to be right everything like that is you know it's hard to break i'm really struggling to build fully build slash understanding each of my options and rps situations uh 
I'll figure out my rock and my paper, but then be stumped on figuring out scissors. This comes with time and theory, but 18 months in, it's kind of a bummer to not have a more solid foundation to it, even if I'm on a newish character. Let me tell you, there are people who have played for 10 years and they don't even understand the basics of this. In fact, that you're 18 months in and you kind of get this is actually, that's actually more of a compliment than you may think, <laughs> believe it or not. I also struggle with even figuring out the RPS of options between two given characters, even between me and a given player. Sometimes it feels like I'm playing rock, paper, scissors, and they're playing grass, water, fire, and Pokemon. I think in more accurate terms, we're playing different layers of RPS. I, I like that, actually. I have no idea what you use to beat that. My last, another thing I'm thinking about is how do you <laughs> lab out different RPS options? Figuring out the RPS after block close hash, it seems simple enough, but labbing out all the ways movement and spacing and buttons work around each other in neutral in the lab, or with the friends, seems downright really tricky slash downright impossible. Does it come down to just grinding it out? Yes, it does. Some other bits, when does RPS happen? Everywhere. Every second. Every second you're gaming. Everything about it is like, you move, it's RPS. It changes how it works. You know what I mean? Every single time. I like this. It was very long. Not to, That is not a, a means of discouraging it, though. I think this is a good way to actually explain a lot of how these things work. Oh, this is cool. This is actually cool. Where does this site? It's automatically zooming in. So I'm going to show this on stream, but I'm sure, I'm sure you should. Maybe just use the gameplay part. Okay, I will. Um, matchup is very scrambly. She's always running in. FU breaking to save me from running into a bunch of things. Oh, I like the questions on the right. That's This is good. This is good. I like this. I like this a lot. This is actually much better. Question, what do I do when I dash block into my opponent's button? How do I follow up? How should I adjust my spacing and get a, a proper whip finish? You can't always. When you are actually dash blocking into them, in a way, it's a good and bad situation. Um, Obviously, you're blocking in that sort of situation, but you should think about like, oh, am I far enough to where if I FD the next hit, am I going to get a punish? If I, Even if I do nothing, like, of course, like, how should you adjust your spacing? It depends on what you're looking for. So this is a lot more of a case of like, are you looking for Geo to press 5H? Are you looking for her to press 2D? Are you looking for her to press dash 5H? Obviously, if you look for one into the other, you will probably dash block into a move, right? You'll probably dash block into something. You cannot evade it. If that happens, it's okay. It's especially one of the better defensive situations because usually you're going to be right on the edge of their button or whatever. And as a result, you're going to have more space to work with. Uh, establishing play feels much better when I know she just wants to go in. I couldn't space 2S consistently, but she got tagged by 2K quite often. So in this sort of case, probably what you want is to represent the threat of preemptive stuff, right? You want to use the threat of a fast preemptive button because in this sort of case that you're mentioning, 2S got dealt with more often than not, but it sounds like with 2K, the safety of it both would help what you're talking about, but also kind of like with how much faster it is and how it can check her, it's a very good button to just kind of throw out sometimes. So in the case of Sin, 2K is probably good if you're like closer, if you're doing like dash, dash block, maybe look for a button then. Whereas if you're further away, something like 2S would be a lot more favorable. Kyle, I got destroyed, LMAO. Stun Dipper, Stun Dipper, Stun Dipper, Stun Dipper, almost always with RC. I was not allowed to move. Yeah, I feel like with Sin against Kai, I mean, it's basically just you once... Kai has meter. This is one of the most important pieces of advice I'll ever give you because I learned this the hard way in Exert. If Kai has 50 meter, just stop trying to run your own strategy. You just wait for him to burn it. Depending on what level of player you play, a lot of players will just burn. They'll just stun it for RC immediately, right? Just instantly. Just instantly they'll do it, right? No matter what. If they do the threat of like, oh, stun dipper, no RC or whatever, then that makes it a little more complicated. If they're doing it at the end of a string or whatever, like usually you basically say, okay, I see you have the meter. I'm going to be more respectful in, ex in expectation for that. Characters like Kai and uh, who is another character? I guess like Leo, like those types of characters have very strong, like greedy offensive options that they'll probably go for a lot of the time. There are probably better examples than Leo, but you get the idea. When I got Stun Dipper, I ate a combo almost every time. So yeah, I, we already went over that. I keep getting my safe jump thrown. Then that just means you're doing it too late. I don't know who is uh, quotations allowed to enforce the RPS first. Is it defined by matchup? I can't run my game unless I deal with this stuff first. Yes, it is. That is almost usually what dictates uh, actually a matchup strategy is how it works. Obvi some characters have options that are inherently easier to force than others, right? Like that's how top tiers exist, right? Like. A top character exists because their options are just 
strong, right? It's not that they're, it's not anything else. It's just like they're, it's harder to deal with on average. So in this sort of case, right? Like, let's say if you're trying to force something after uh, your pressure, or if it's not super safe, if they have 50 meter, you are over committing basically, because wow. that inherently is a threat that he can always represent. Of course, like there's, it, there's wins and losses for how it works too. Like if you just bait out his stun dip for RC, even if you get like, even though you're in block stun, the fact that you burn 60 meter or 50 meter and he's still in a, you know, he's got negative penalty on his meter gain for a while. That's very good for you, which in turn makes it so you get to RPS more in the future. So it's not just more about like, oh, I, I do everything I want the first time I want it. It's more so about like you play around how he wants to play it, what he wants and kind of playing around resources to get there, right? Naga only got one full match in connection issues cause of DC mid match. Do the second match. With eight five HS, I don't think I have a pot punish for that. Um after this it became very difficult to find positions where I felt safe trying to do my RPS. Growing frustrated caused me to dash into Beyblade for all of game two. His art code or whatever said, can't wait to kick your ass or something. So I immediately went into the game tilted. Don't worry, they just people are having fun. <laughs> <laughs> and can't wait to kick your ass. You need a safe secondary alternative. Hard to really control it. Connect data on the RPS I want to play if I never got the opportunity to play it. Maybe I chose too passive of a thing to try. Maybe I misunderstood the assignment and she wanted something more. That's me, by the way. She, uh, to the effect of hit, peak driver, neutral, munch, and see what they do about it. Uh, it can be like that as well. It's both ways. Like, again, RPS is all encompassing. So you still did it by being passive. You may not feel it was as effective because you got more overwhelmed by what they're doing. I feel like I'm just practicing how to deal with my opponent's forced RPS instead of trying to force my own. That is still very good. In fact, this is something I would almost recommend to do, but usually it comes secondary to people. Match what, but Brain was still in Nago mode though. So I managed to play his RPS well once I had that. That's how I knew he wanted to spend blood. Showed just enough belligerence that he always wanted to special cancel his stuff. So once I caught caught on i clamped down on my defense and he popped blood range during his own pressure four times to let me win the next two sets i'm sure if the rps i wanted to force is actually very unusable versus nago or if it's a skill issue it could be both i won't lie uh but of course like nago versus sin i would assume is not super <laughs> not super flexible for sin if i understand my opponent's rps better than they do i can often take advantage of them uh, while it works against low level nagos i think it's ultimately a bad idea to stick to this matchup plan i've been using and you figure out how I can force my own game plan on Nago rather than trying to beat him at a game he's favorite at. That is also true. So um, as a result, like what it sounds like you're struggling with is you are basically being passive. But it's clear that you're also, while you're being passive, you're not super used to playing passively at the same time. So you can mention here, you whiffed a ton of buttons, but I never found the right response to actually punish them. So usually that means you're not used to actually looking for them, which means it won't feel good. <laughs> it will not feel good to do this. But the reason why I made people do homework, it's because of shit like this, because it's to make you get more in the habit, look for things like this. This is something to training mode, right? And something to look. So uh, let's finish this up. I think I mostly got ahead of myself here and it's really take advantage of the strategy I wanted to try and force. I really need to be good enough at the game. Not really so, but you get what I mean in basis or connection with it. That's so doing all the really stupid extra work on top really did make me see stupid RPS as I played and it kind of prevented every thought interaction, which maybe was more the point. Yes! Yes! I still don't have the mental stamina that I can stay cognizant in the game for long periods of time. That's okay. That's why I recommend notes as well between rounds. There's a lot of autopilot during games. There's this kind of seesaw effect I've been feeling where I feel I'm noticing. I'm really focusing on strategy in game. My mechanical execution suffers, but when I want to focus slash make sure my execution is clean, I'm using the right uh, routes and setups, my strategy brain gets weaker. That's normal too. In general, though, I lack so much stamina, just basic internalization of some concepts. The range of my place, my play is all over. Oh, I'll give you a, uh, I'll give you a, a, a B plus too. I, I'm actually going to give, give them a B plus as well. No, I'm, I'm going to give you both a minus because you both wrote a lot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't read this. And you and you wrote this. And you included this. Um, you did get it. Um, and that's kind of the point. Like this was not necessarily to make you understand how to play your character better. This was to make you understand how to RPS. And in all cases, it sounds like people were like, it clicked, right? That's what I like, oh, it makes more sense to me now. Um, even if it didn't. I hope this kind of breakdown helped a bit and helped make it make more sense. But yeah, thanks a lot for watching. Thanks a lot for hanging out.